a lot more labor work i think that's valuable that's out there that we need yeah do you feel i mean we're all because you've lived everywhere right i've i've been well yeah i've been around yeah but i graduated high school in cloverdale did you really oh yeah you didn't know that see i didn't realize you were from sonoma i didn't know you were from sonoma i thought like you ended up here you didn't start oh no i i was well let's see i was born and uh just to go quickly my life story i was born in hayward at eden hospital and then elementary school primarily in sonoma uh middle school sonoma and then santa rosa high school santa rosa back to the east bay in dublin and then i finished out in florida so i'm like a primarily east bay north bay guy yeah separated parents when i was six and then were you changing schools because you were changing which household you were primary pretty much yeah that's interesting it's a Gen X thing. We were just bouncing around. Yeah. He, he, so that's the, I was going to ask you about that. So Gen X also, I feel like we were prepared for these times because what we were told or what we were. You mean the end times of COVID? Yeah, exactly that. Because <laughs> I think that what our, um, our movement, if you want to call it that, like, you know, millennials, I think have the things that they tendencies, our tendency was a worldview that said, it's all going to break. It's everybody else's fault. And you might as well just be miserable because oh, something's yeah. going to happen. And so when this stuff started happening, not only with COVID, but also with social unrest and everything else, I was like, like, yeah, I'm so primed for this. Because the Gen Xers were like, <laughs> have you ever read like Shampoo Planet and like all those like defining things and a lot of the early, um, like, uh, like, like Chuck Palahniuk and some of the earlier stuff, not dystopian, but basically like we're all animals and we're all going to eat each other alive until there's only one standing. Like that's, we all know that's where it's going to go. Well, yeah, we were prepared for this. What's what's your Chicago connection? So I left, um, I graduated college in 99, and then in 2001, I moved to Chicago. Um, I was working in publishing and radio, and I thought, I'll just do it there. And quite honestly, a friend of mine um, had moved to Chicago a number of years Which before. is a good place to be, by the way. Yeah, especially for radio. It's yeah. actually a really great place for, for development of those radio careers. Isn't this American Life out of Chicago? Yeah, the BB Easy. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, mind. that's the... Center of the universe. Yeah. Now, yeah. now you're kind of like stomping on it for me. But um, so I moved was, there to, to, to basically <laughs> okay. do commercial radio because I was doing like uh, mostly it was producing some talk radio, but I was mostly doing like commercial radio. And that was uh, at the time, Chicago was one of the last bastions for independent radio that wasn't clear channel. And I was working for a private uh, radio network called Three Eagles in Nebraska. And uh, and I worked in an academic press. But Three Eagles was privately owned and, and was more of a family-owned fam- uh, group of stations in there in South Dakota and some other places. And they were always going to be fighting against the big radio stations coming in and basically stomping all over your ad revenue. And I thought, well, I'll just do this in Chicago. And they had um, uh, KZRT, was it KZRT, XRT, um, WXRT in Chicago was independent until like maybe five, six years ago. And it was completely uh, collectively run. And it was the best radio station in Chicago. There were huge commercial markets, but that was the place to work, or WGN, which was the big talk radio. And so I went there to try to get careers there. Never worked. Well, not only that, but they're probably pumping signal out through. I mean, how far yeah. west would they go? I mean, that, I could, I could just, get WGN in Nebraska. I mean, right. those are repeaters. But so I, I was going to do that, and then nothing worked. I ended up getting falling into audio production and live theater, and some sound design, like uh, some bands and um, some local performances that I would capture and do live audio capture. And then at the time, it was all mini disc stuff, and I was doing some mini-disc. work for like. Did you say mini disc? Yeah, I just went through my collection of mini disc. <laughs> the Sony, the did, Sony mini disc. Yeah. I just did redigit. I digitized. I mean, it's digital recording. It was a great I, product, by the way. It was, but it was useless because if you wanted a five minute song, it took you five minutes to transfer it because it <laughs> transferred it in real time. And so I just went through my entire collection and digitized all of them. And then I'm going to release them as like a little bit of an archive library somewhere. But yeah. it's kind of like with the Betamax. Exactly that. I was like, yeah. going to transfer because also they're, they're, they take up space, whereas like, you know, a hard drive takes up no space. And, 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 I, and what I found was one of them, I found a band that I, remember recording like i know the band and and they disbanded shortly after one of my last recordings i was like i wonder and I, the way i found that out is i typed in their name and they had a facebook page i was like well i'm not gonna look that up but there was another link and that link went to some guy's website and it was a page that wasn't linked from his main site and it was like yeah i was the lead in a band and now i do marketing and you know here's you know a history about my band hopefully somebody's going to search for this term and no find way. it and so I'm going to contact him and send him back the recording of his 
what might have been one of his last concerts and be like, hey. And what's weird is I listened oh, to that be band. Awesome. Well, I listened to it and I was like, this is amazing because I remember all the lyrics. I remember where I was. It. I remember the the um. The oh, I got a totally and, random story like that. But it was, and I had, and there was a couple, of, and there's a couple other bands that I recorded, and I followed up with them, and they're in Seattle now, but they're. You know, suburban people who work in technology, who have like, you know, kids. And, <laughs> right. Ten years later, everybody's life is like 20 years so, ago. yeah, so right. different. So, yeah. And so I was like, oh, and I'm going to reach out to him and say, I have these old mini disc recordings of your band that I, the one was a couple that were in a band together and they had two bands. This is here. throws back to Chicago. Chicago was cutthroat music when I got there because Smashing Pumpkins were big and Wilco. And you ended up, if you were not big in music, um, you were on your way to making it big in music. Like every, everybody it was, was, it was a stop on the way up. Yeah. And, and Chicago was a really that great whole scene. genesis of good, which means good clubs. Rock, yeah. And they had yeah, a good like metro circuit and where people could, and, and this, people could eat yes. performing. Yeah. And it, and it was, it was a lot like, um, maybe some clubs were on the West coast and East coast already, but that, that wasn't really there. Like bands were some, an afterthought in Chicago. And anyway, so now they were at the forefront and, uh, in order to so you, so you could hire a band by just opening the door right so that was the whole point so if you were a band you needed to fight hard to get shows and what this couple did is they would book and they would say okay well we just need to find an opener and say oh we have another opener and they would provide another like CD of this other band and they'd be like here's the other opener we think you should hire them to open it. like oh yeah they sound good we'll have it hire them too it's like oh we'll put them in contact with them it was them and they would just dress up differently and they would do opening band which was that band in particular was uh they just replayed did uh, they have a name of the band or so i'm trying to think of i think it was called um they re recreated uh, nintendo theme songs with guitars oh that's awesome and i can't remember i think it was called like player one or or game over it was one of those right. kind of things like right, that. right 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 Ties and then their the other game. band was called the industry and that was a concept band where the whole idea was they were a band on the run so they're just here playing rock music but they got to get in their car and go out because like you know the the popo is on somebody's on coming like that. and that the theme of the, it was like very driving rock and they would play 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 and it would just they would just kind of constantly go and then at some point they would just stop and the song Mid-song would end and, and, they would just, and they would just leave <laughs> the stage as if they had to run away and they were both bands, but they would dress differently. So they got paid for both bands. Oh. And, and, and not very many people figured it out. That's hilarious. But it was like, how many you Genius. Know, three pieces with a woman on bass are there? In I Chicago, there's actually a ton of them, <laughs> but yeah. And then they would, and they generally sounded very different. So yeah, I got to figure out what that other band was that they did. But yeah. Anyway. And, the, and then what? So you're in Chicago. Yeah. And then I met a woman and, and we oh. moved out to San Francisco for her master's degree. And I, you know, needed to produce. Uh, at the time, I was working a day job in a law department. And it was like, great, I can walk around in khakis during the day. But at night, I'm like up till five in the morning doing crazy gigs and doing shows all over the place and having a great time um, and not making any money at it, but really, really happy. What, it, doing like sound en- engineering? I, or? I was doing some digital storytelling. So oh, okay. it was early days, but I was doing a lot of stuff like via transom or, you know, I was trying to get in at WBZ yeah. and that that wasn't going to work. And I had some grants for some audio. I did some audio art stuff and I was like, really, I did a whole documentary about people on the red line. And so I spent 18 months interviewing people on the train and then mix it together and then produce it in an art gallery. So you were like sitting in a train car. And so you would hear these random voices talking. Oh, it's that's a lot awesome. like what I do now. It's very similar to what I do now, which is like the early days of that. And I feel like now, and then I hit pause. In well, you got the vote years. thing going at Pedalum Art, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that was a collaboration with Michael, my office mate. Um, so he invited me down with Amy. Um, Sorry, it, so, yeah. T- yeah. Tell so, me about the project. So, so that project? Yeah. So what happened was um, the Pedalum Art Center has a larger umbrella uh, set of projects called Deeds, not Words. Um, and... or deeds and actions i can't remember exactly what the the group of it was but the idea was they wanted a lot of things that were about this um centennial of suffrage but also recognition of the vote as a central act or the the deed of democracy and um sheltering in petaluma was a podcast that i produced out of a grant from that which was meant to be a a mini series so to speak a limited run podcast about people in petaluma and what they were going through at the times and during that production we had the black lives matter marches here in uh, petaluma and so it kind of took a turn where it started paying more attention to the struggle of what this was rather than 
oh, I'm spending more time with my cat or something like yeah, that. Yeah, no, turned, social it justice took a, took a hard, hard turn. turn, which I is think good. It was, it was I mean, an, it was an due. App thing. But it also felt like this was the wrong platform to address that. Was to I didn't want to continue a podcast that was meant to be twelve minute stories about you know how things were going. This COVID week. life, yeah. yeah. And I and I also feel like that's the wrong lens to look at. My difficulty. cat's trying to kill me. Yeah, and then <laughs> and then that evolved into other projects. And so this one was they decided one month before the election they were going to have invite people to come and make signs, and they had um, a screen printing printed on demand shirts that said "Vote on them" with a design that came out of. Uh, Fieldwork Sonoma, which is oh, okay. Tyler Young, and so he did a shirt, and then there and, and Ace did the printing, and then uh, Amy did all the uh, Amy and her other two producers were Lisa and Amy. Amy. I don't know who Amy is. Um, Amy Critchard. Oh, okay. And um, it's Michael Wolsey's sister, and so they were you know like hashing this idea, and then their idea was let's have this day. Um, uh, the other people are Cinda Gill and and uh, Lisa Demetrios were the other two producers. Have people come in, get their portrait shot by Michael, and he does the Rivertown Revival shots, like that style. Yeah, that's those him. portraits are great. That's him. great. Yeah, I've been work. watching them on Instagram. So, And then he'll do a portrait of you with some sort of like what you feel about voting, and then you popped outside, and I interviewed you about what voting meant to you um, the first time you voted and what voting means to you now. And then we mix the two together, and I use his stills and overlay the audio, uh, a quote of the audio of what person's telling, and then we release those as audiograms as a... a a way to get to permeate people's like scrolling through Instagram. And right. it's just a little 30 second, 60 second thing about what they think. No, about they're voting. Great. They're engaging a certain way. They're definitely personal. We don't do any editing. We let people say what they will and, and present it. And it, um, I want to do more of that where it's a soapbox style where I want to give voice to people without any sort of editorial yeah, um, you've, space. You've, you've tried the story or you've worked on the storytelling piece before. Yeah, like I did. Your audio stage, booth kind of. Yeah. And that's in the, and that's the, and quite frankly, I had a business where I was doing portable audio booths for events to like capture things at weddings or memorials or something to do audio content capture at live events and, you know, uh, festival music festivals and like, oh, I'm having a great time at Bottle Rock and blah, blah, blah. And, and doing some of those things. Well, I'm not going to make any money if I had a business that was focused on large groups of people getting in small spaces. So it's not going to happen. Yeah, but, not anymore. And but I can still, <laughs> but I still like the idea of having some sort of soapbox where people can say uh, f- and and help people tell the story they want to tell. So I'm doing stuff at KPCA, which is part of Petaluma Community Access, um, and trying to encourage people to produce content for that. And then Audio Ephemera is my production side. It's just me, um, but it's you know I have four or five podcasts that I've either done or produced, and then working on other live capture audio stuff or. You know, I do a little bit for commercial audio for capturing audio for commercials and some post-production work. So it's a nice. hodgepodge of things that I want to do. Yeah. And, 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 and now you got a space. And now I have a space and it, you know, I built a little solo booth, like a, a voice recording booth. And I'll get back into voiceover work if I can. But that's, it's, it's hard to switch over to that when I have a lot of client stuff that right. I'm trying to get done. So, so that's what I'm kind of doing now. But. You'll find it. I think. I think what you should do is you should find a thing to do for a certain period of time, and maybe it's a volunteering thing where you're like, "I'm going to do this," or coach a league or something like. Oh that. yeah, no, no, no. And then sure. you find your rhythm because I think it takes a while to go through those life transitions. I still feel I left my corporate job a year and a half ago, and I still feel. I remember you went out and got a tattoo. Oh, I have like twenty. Well, I know, but wasn't there a? Oh yeah, that one's from Greg. He yeah. just opened up, so Petaluma like tattoos open. Petaluma so tattoo, Greg. Yeah, go see him. Yeah. And Nick, it's uh, it, Nick's genius inception. That building is amazing, and he transformed it. And in the interior is where just, are they? So they're um, at I'm going to say like roughly four fifteen or so. Four, no, like in the four teens, something like that. Four hundred block of uh, Peloma Boulevard South. You'll see it because it's like the light green um, building. Oh, he's okay. repainted the house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There. Um, and it's uh, yeah, and it, it's a just tattoo shop and art gallery and i think he was originally slated to open april 1st and he did all the work oh, himself geez. and all the design work and he it's a very nick is a very patient person and uh i can't imagine in these world putting all of your ducks in a row and then being told you absolutely 2020 do it. Yeah. yeah especially tattooing because they must be particularly hard on tattoo shops right 
I think they are definitely it's in like the a hair salon, right? like that. Exactly. And the, well, hair salons are a little different that they went back about a month ago, but, right. um, uh, I think estheticians and people who are, but close, they're highly regulated is my point already though. So that's my, that's what I mean. They're already, too, like, how are we going to settle this? Because I think there's some people that were already providing a very sanitary environment. COVID aside, it was, you know, they were already a business that did they not. They would seen the most. Ca- 